Okay, let me share my screen here. Okay, go to the first slide. Uh, want to get this thing together. Okay. Um, I think uh, I might, I should be unmuted, right? Yep, you're unmuted and everything looks good on our end. Uh, okay, let me uh, go back here. Um, let me get rid of that thing. All right, great. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's nice to be here uh, today to give you uh, an overview of our research on cancer as a metabolic disease. And uh, the information uh, on this will be will have major implications for how we approach and manage uh, the disease. So let me um, try to move this thing forward here. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not, you may yeah. you may have to um, so try um, and ending your slideshow and share it again one more time. Uh, Let's see. Share it again. New uh, no, share. Uh, uh, no, uh, exit exit um, your slideshow. So right click on on your slideshow and hit and, and show. Uh, or okay. Oh, all right. Let me. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, and then start one more time. Okay. Let's see here if it works. I wasn't able to move forward. Okay. Share. Okay. Try try moving forward now. All right. Oh, still, still a little uh, not able to move forward here. Let's see, because it was moving forward just a minute ago. I don't know. Oh, here we go. All right, I, I have to hit the bu the button on the bottom. Okay, it should be fine. Yeah, I, I'll hit the button, not the one on my computer, uh, my 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 keypad here. All right. So so anyway, I mean, getting back, uh, I gave you the title, and now um, uh, this this first or this next slide here. It uh, shows the data. Now, I, I collect this data from, this is all published information from the American Cancer Society. Every year, uh, American Cancer Society comes out with their so-called statistics, cancer statistics, and anyone can uh, go back and, um, and get these. Uh, Dr. Siegel uh, is the most recent person cataloging the number of cases and deaths per year. Um, and then to figure out deaths per day, you simply divide deaths per year by 365, and you have an estimate of um, how many people are dying each day from cancer. So th these are the numbers from 2013 to 2021. Um, and you can see there's a four point, uh, well, 12% increase in new cases, but also about a 4.6% increase in deaths per day and, and deaths per uh, year, which is parallel to the approximate increase in the population, U.S. population size during these same, over the same period. So, so the bottom line here is that we're not making any major drop. Um, you know, it's, it's stagnating. Uh, you know, you hear about all this stuff, and I'll talk about some of the stuff that we hear about on TV and all these kinds of things. All the great progress that we are making in keeping people alive longer happier and all this kind of stuff you hear advertised uh, on television. But when you look at, at the uh, statistics, um, we don't see that, okay? We don't see major drops. It's just a continual, gradual increase year in and year out. So, um, uh, and, and this is a paper that was published a couple of years ago uh, that evaluated all the drugs that have been FDA approved, 92 different drugs for cancer that have been approved from 2000 to 2016. Um, and, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, these novel cancer therapies, they are associated with uh, substantial tumor responses, but the median overall survival uh, was increased by only about 2.4 months. This is very interesting. So in other words, when you take these drugs, it looks like your tumor is responding, but your overall survival is not that greatly increased. And many of these drugs are extremely expensive. And um, not only are they associated with um, physical toxicities, but they can also be associated with uh, financial toxicity and trying to pay for them. And you wouldn't mind paying the money if, if you could get a substantial 
impact in quality of life and overall survival, but um, that's not the case. So the question we ask ourselves is why are we not making the kind of progress in managing cancer that we should be making considering the enormous monies that have been devoted to this disease through not only federal research funding, but also through all of these private foundations. So uh, we'll, we'll address that. Um, you know, and, and here's, here's a paper that was published some years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, hyperprogressive disease in patients with advanced non-small cell cancer treated with PD-1 slash PD-L1 inhibitors. The, the names of these you hear on TV, this is your uh, Updevo and Keytruda. Uh, and these are the names of the, of the PD-1, PD-1 and PD-L1 drugs. Now it's interesting. Um, there are some, and you can see the poor overall survival that you have here for uh, lung cancer. You know, you're up to 22 years is the most. You can see the patients start at 138, um, 138 patients. And you can see how fast they drop off. Um, now, the uh, standard of care, the toxic drugs that they use, um, you know, you don't get a really good long-term survival for, for lung cancer. But with um, uh, Opdivo and Keytruda, you, you can get, some patients can, in fact, do, do well. Um, the majority of, pa of patients don't show any, any therapeutic benefit. But what's most disturbing is that there is a, about 15 to 16% of the patients treated with these drugs actually die much faster. Um, it's called hyperprogressive disease. And this is seen now, more and more papers are coming out, not only for lung cancer, but for, for a variety of different cancers. The treatments themselves accelerate the speed with which the patients die. And you don't, often don't hear that when, it, it, when these drugs are, are, are discussed. But anyway, this, there's a number of, this is a paper, you can read it. Uh, all the references are here from JAMA Oncology um, that discuss this. And there's many, many more papers that discuss this concept of hyperprogressive disease, right? So, so um, now what's the problem? Why are we not making any progress, major progress in cancer management? And that's because we have misunderstood the nature of, of what cancer actually is. So this paper we just recently published with my colleague, Dr. Christos Shinopoulos from Semmelweis University in Hungary, world expert on uh, mitochondria. Can the mitochondrial metabolic theory explain better the origin and management of cancer than can the somatic mutation theory? And I'm gonna, I'll be discussing these concepts uh, so that you have a clear idea about both uh, of, these, of these theories. So, what causes a growth regulated normal cell to become a growth dysregulated cancer cell? So this uh, cartoon here of a, of a cell uh, shows you the organelles. This is the nucleus, uh, this large section here, um, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, all these different organelles. But the organelle, the mitochondrion here, uh, this is a cross section. It's like a spaghetti network through the cytoplasm. This is the organelle, the mitochondrion, that's responsible for the generation of most of the energy in our cells. Uh, we breathe air, uh, we get what we call oxidative respiration, and the, uh, and the oxygen in the air that we breathe uh, serves as a, an acceptor of electrons to generate ATP, uh, adenosine triphosphate, which is the gold currency for energy. Without ATP, nothing in our lives in our brain, in our, any of our organs can work without ATP. And ATP is life, ATP is energy. Without ATP, nothing can grow. So the ATP in our cells is largely produced in this uh, organelle, the mitochondria. Mitochondrial respiratory damage is the origin of cancer. And I'll present the evidence for this. So the, uh, 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 what happens, this organelle, and I'll show you how it can become damaged, and once it becomes damaged, it releases these reactive radicals that cause the mutations in the nucleus. So the somatic DNA mutations and most other abnormalities seen in cancer cells are downstream effects of mitochondrial respiratory damage. So the mutations and the cancer, and I'll show you why cancer is not a genetic disease. All of these mutations that people seem to focus on um, are all downstream effects. They're not the cause, they're the effects. The cause of cancer 
is a mitochondrial disruption of oxidative phosphorylation, respiration. They, mutations are effects, not causes. This is, this is underlies the, the reason why we're not ma making any major advances in cancer, because the field focuses on mutations. And if you focus on a downstream effect as, as, as your primary attention, you're not going to make the advances that you should make. And I'll show you the evidence for that. So in order to, you have to understand scientific theories. These theories um, are simply an attempt to explain the facts of nature. We as a, as a species, we examine things, we look at things, and then we try to explain things of nature in the context of a theory. So reality is based on replicated facts, whereas the interpretation of the facts is based on a credible theory. So if we go back in history and we can look at different uh, theories to explain the phenomenon of nature. So the heliocentric theory, that, that the heliocentric theory is where the sun is the center of the solar system. This could uh, theory could explain better the movements of the celestial bodies than could the geocentric theory. The geocentric theory stated that the uh, earth was the center of the solar system. So it was Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler that uh, identified the heliocentric theory. And most people accept that today. We all know that the uh, earth revolves around the sun. But for centuries, um, Ptolemy, uh, uh, the scientists of, 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 of centuries ago uh, said, no, no, the earth was the center of the, uh, 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 of, of the universe. And you, you, ha uh, you have to recognize that Giordano Bruno, uh, an Italian, uh, was burned at the stake for uh, trying to support uh, the Copernican Galileo theory. So you have to realize that uh, challenging, ch challenging these theories can, can sometimes um, be met with uh, severe penalties. The germ theory of Louis Pasteur could explain better the origin of contagious diseases than could the uh, miasma or bad air theory of, of Galen. So uh, um, uh, we now know germs, germs cause contagious diseases. These could be viruses, bacteria, or whatever. But for many centuries, it was thought to be bad air. Um, the uh, Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution by natural selection could explain better the origin of species than could the theory of special creation. And nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So the question that I'm going to address today is can the mitochondrial metabolic theory explain better the origin and management of cancer than can the somatic mutation theory? So this is what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, the concept of cancer is a genetic disease or is cancer a mitochondrial metabolic disease? All right, so right now, today in our world, um, the current dogma is that cancer is a genetic disease. Uh, this paper by uh, Dr. Hannah Han and Weinberg is the most highly cited paper in all of the biological literature. Over 75,000 times this paper has been cited in all these various research uh, papers. Cancer cells carry the oncogenic and tumor suppressor mutations that define cancer as a genetic disease. Um, and this concept now, if you go to uh, freshman biology in college, uh, medical school, um, this is what is discussed. Cancer is a genetic disease. There is no other discussion uh, of alternative um, uh, theories uh, uh, on cancer. And everybody's looking for cancer mutations and all this kind, kind of things that you read about and hear about. And it's also supported by the National Cancer Institute. Um, how cancer arises. This is, if you go on to the National Cancer Institute uh, website, uh, webpage, uh, how cancer arises. It says right here, cancer is a genetic disease, that it is caused by changes in genes that control the way our cells function, especially how they grow and divide. Cancer is caused by certain changes to genes, the basic physical units of inheritance. Genes are arranged in long strands in DNA called chromosomes. So the National Cancer Institute, a branch of the National Institutes of Health, clearly says that cancer is a genetic disease. So obviously, if all the medical schools and all the universities in the classrooms and the National Cancer Institute are saying the same thing, this becomes a dogma. It becomes an irrefutable truth that no one begins to question. 
So this is uh, the, the importance of what we're, we're looking at here. And then, you know, the hallmarks of cancer, let's say, this was put out by, by Hannah Hannah and Weinberg, uh, sustaining proliferative signaling, okay? Evading growth suppressors. And I'll go into a little bit more of this. Uh, activating invasion and metastasis. I'll be sp speaking about this. Enabling replicative immortality. Inducing angiogenesis, which is abnormal blood vessel growth in the tumor, in the tumor tissue. And resisting cell death. So um, all of this is controlled by gene mutations according to the somatic mutation theory. And it's also important to rec recognize these are random, random gene mutations are controlling all of these hallmarks. And then to solidify the dogmatic view of the somatic mutation theory, <clears throat> we present <clears throat> these little uh, figures and diagrams. A car speeding out of control because it has genes that uh, accelerate the rate of cell division. And we have mutations in tumor suppressor genes. In other words, you cannot stop cell division out of control. And people, if you wanna know what cancer is, people say, what is cancer? The definition of cancer is cell division out of control, okay? Cell division out of control is the definition of cancer. According to the somatic mutation theory, these are uh, 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 mutations in uh, proto-oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. This is the definition. And then here's another um, image that is often used in biology textbooks. Uh, the so accumulation of random somatic mutations cause the development of a cancer cell. So a normal cell is here, then you collect one, two, three, four, I don't know, uh, it could be hundreds of mutations, one mutation, nobody, nobody really knows. And, and then you move this cell from normal growth regulation to a dysmorphic looking cell that is uh, dysregulated in cell growth. And here's a comment from Dr. Uh, Vogelstein from, the, from uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School. We now know precisely what causes cancer, a sequential series of alterations in well-defined driver genes, okay? So you have a lot of different kinds of mutations that you see in cancer cells, but only the driver genes are the most important for driving the dysregulated growth uh, 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 of, of these cells. Here, and as a consequence, you hear about you know personalized therapy, precision medicine. These are the terms that have been derived from uh, the view of cancer as a genetic disease. So we take biopsy material from tissue, and then we look. Uh, this individual here is looking at cancer cells from a biopsy material of of, of a person's breast tissue, and looking for extra copies of a particular gene. Um, and that information then will tell you whether or not you should do this or that for diagnosis and possible therapy. And here's the situation, observer effect. When you take a biopsy of a, of a particular tissue, you, have, uh, you run the possibility of creating inflammatory oncotaxis. And what that means is that you disturb the microenvironment of the tissue which can increase the risk of spreading the tumor cells uh, uh, further through the tissue or even throughout the body. We call that an observer effect. It's as if you were to approach a wasp hive uh, in the middle of the day and stick it. There's a, a possibility that the wasps will come out of the hive and sting you, all right? So you've, uh, uh, you've changed the environment. And, and this now we now know can uh, also uh, contribute to the spread. Uh, it's a risk factor for the spread uh, of some cancers, something to keep in mind. Okay, so we're going to challenge the somatic mutation theory with uh, significant information that seems to be either not or don't people want to hear it. So these are the, 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 the Nico monkeys um, uh, and uh, you know, they don't want, they, when you come up with a new idea, challenging a dogmatic view, uh, most people in the field, they don't want to look at the information. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to hear about it. Okay. This is the kind of, well, basically you, you ignore it. When something is against your, 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 your dogmatic view on anything, uh, oftentimes it's, it's not possible to accept this. So I'm going to go through with you now and 
uh, show evidence, publish papers uh, that challenge the somatic mutation theory of cancer. So how did the idea come about that cancer was a genetic disease in the first place? Well, this uh, scientist, Theodore Bovary, in 1914 published a paper uh, suggesting the possibility that the dysregulated growth of cancer cells could be due to abnormalities in chromosomes, the genetic material in the cell. However, it was very interesting if you read this paper, um, Bovary uh, uh, came into this field with no knowledge of cancer and he was very apologetic. He said that, you know, I know nothing about cancer. I just have this idea. Maybe it's right, maybe it's not right. I don't know, but let me just write it anyway. Well, the field embraced uh, Bovary many years later and anointed him as the founding father of the somatic mutation theory. And I'm sure Bovary would be very displeased by this because he knew nothing he was completely ignorant of cancer. And he says that. He says, I'm an interloper and I don't really know anything about cancer. Um, and now, you know, with more and more analysis of tumors, we're finding some, not all, very, very few, but they're there, uh, where some cancer cells have no mutations. And um, how is it possible? Now, this doesn't happen a lot. Most cancers do, in fact, have all kinds of uh, mutations, and I'll talk about that. But there are some cancers that don't have any mutations, and uh, they've been looked for and uh, you can't find them. So uh, how can you have a disease caused by mutations if there are some tumors that have no mutations? And this is published, and most of the people in the field uh, either ignore it or don't discuss it. Um, now the driver, this is new information over the last couple of years, um, cancer driver genes found in normal cells. What does that mean? What do you mean? I, I was just telling you from the work of Vogelstein that the driver genes are the, are the genes that make and drive the dysregulated cell growth. Well, now with deep sequencing, we're looking at tissues in people uh, and all kinds of tissues in normal people that never develop cancer, yet they have uh, expression of these so-called driver genes. How can you have driver genes in normal tissues that don't, don't form cancer? So there's no discussion about tumors that have no mutations or normal tissues that have the driver genes that never form cancer, not discussed, not, but yet it's in these papers. And we know some carcinogens cause do not cause mutations like asbestos. Asbestos doesn't cause mutations, but asbestos is a powerful carcinogen. And then the rarity of cancer in chimpanzees is very, is very perplexing in light of the somatic mutation theory because the chimpanzee and the human uh, arose from a common ancestor and um, they're our closest biological relatives, uh, a 98% similar in genetic and protein sequence structure Yet uh, cancer is extremely rare in chimpanzees. Uh, in fact, there's never been a documented case of breast cancer in a female chimpanzee, despite the fact that over 30,000 American women each year die from breast cancer. So what's going on? Well, it's pr predominantly diet and lifestyle. The chimps are eating the diet and they have a lifestyle uh, uh, very similar to the way it was when they first emerged. On the other hand, had marcated dramatically from the diet and lifestyle that we had when we first emerged as a species. Uh, there's a non-mutagenic origin of metastatic behavior. I'll talk about I'll talk about that. Uh, metastasis is the most um, uh, deadly aspect of, of cancer. And now I'm going to talk about the nuclear transfer experiments, uh, which are another fact that completely uh, 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 undermines the somatic mutation theory of cancer. And I, as I said before, I, I published this paper in 2015, very highly uh, 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 cited and acknowledged and read paper. Um, but again, it's very difficult pill to swallow. If you think cancer is a genetic disease and then you read this paper and you look at the repeated evidence uh, that it cannot be uh, a genetic disease. And this is the summary of many replicated experiments using different kinds of cancers, different experimental prof uh, protocols, yet coming to a similar uh, conclusion. So let's look, we have a normal cell in the green. We have a nice nucleus, no mutations. We have a little, these little bean shaped mitochondria, very healthy producing energy through oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, normal cells beget normal cells. And if they divide the growth, uh, uh, they have regulated uh, division, regulated growth. Cancer cells beget cancer cells. They have most cancer cells, yes, have a lot of mutations in the nucleus. They also have defects in the mitochondria. Oxidative phosphorylation respiration is defective. Cancer cells beget cancer cells, and these cells have dysregulated growth, right? They growth, 
growth uh, out of control. Dysregulate is the origin of cancer. So the question is, what is responsible for the dysregulated growth? Is it the mutations in the nucleus or is it the abnormalities in the cytoplasm in these mitochondria? So this was clearly addressed by asking uh, what happens when you move the nucleus from a tumor cell and now place it into a normal cytoplasm with normal mitochondria. And the cells that you got were uh, regulated in growth. In other words, they, they were like normal cells. They didn't have dysregulated growth despite the presence of the cancer nucleus, okay? On the other hand, if the nucleus of a, of a normal cell was to be placed into the cytoplasm of a tumor cell with abnormal mitochondria, the cells either died or the ones that didn't die had dysregulated cell growth. Just the opposite of what you would have expected. Here, th this should have had the dysregulated growth and this should have been the normal growth, just the opposite. Newer experiments, are showing that if you replace the abnormal mitochondria with normal mitochondria, you can get regulated growth. All of this information clearly and profoundly says that cancer cannot be due to the mutations in the nucleus. They are due primarily, cancer is due to abnormalities in the mitochondria in the cytoplasm. That's what this, all of this information points to. So there's a fundamental profound misunderstanding in the scientific cancer field that, uh, on the origin of the disease. So if somatic mutations are not the origin of cancer. How do we get cancer? How does it arise? Well, this goes back as, as it was said in the intro that Warburg, the German uh, scientist uh, from the 1920s, 30s, uh, he passed away in 1970 actually. Um, but he clearly showed that cancer arises from chronic damage to cellular respiration, the way we get energy from oxygen. Energy through fermentation gradually compensates for insufficient respiration. Fermentation is energy without oxygen. It's a very primitive, ancient form of generating energy. Cancer cells continue to ferment glucose in the presence of oxygen, which is referred to as the Warburg effect, and we call this aerobic fermentation. Cells should not ferment in the presence of oxygen. Cancer cells continue to ferment in the presence of oxygen. Very abnormal. Now, uh, there was a lot of controversy about Warburg's findings, but we filled in, we discovered that uh, uh, cancer cells also ferment an amino acid, glutamine. Glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in our bloodstream, the most abundant amino acid in our body. It's an amino acid, glutamine. And this uh, cancer cells will ferment glutamine. They can burn glutamine in the absence of oxygen for energy. And we call this the Q effect to make, make sure it's different from the Warburg effect. Q is the singular letter that identifies glutamine in the biochemistry uh, um, profile. So this is the missing link in Otto Warburg's central theory um, that we now know that cancer cells survive on fermentation, but they will fer ferment uh, lactic acid from glu glucose and they'll fer ferment succinic acid from glutamine. So the cancer cells are deriving their energy from fermentation rather than from uh, oxidative respiration. Now, the important issue here is that enhanced fermentation is the signature metabolic mal malady of all cancer cells. We've looked into this. So if you look at cancer, all these cancer cells have different mutations. There's different cell types, so all these kind of heterogeneity, but they're all fermenting. So the signature metabolic ma malady is fermentation driven by glucose and glutamine. It's, and you'll come to realize that if we target glucose and glutamine, we can manage the majority of cancers. So let's look at the evidence to support Warburg's central theory that cancer is damaged respiration. So this is an electron micrograph of a mitochondria because these are tiny, tiny organelles in the cytoplasm of the cell. And you need to use electron microscopy to really see the structure uh, of the organelle. So you can see these nice stripes that you see here through the normal mitochondrion. And um, these are called cristae and they contain the lipids and proteins of the electron transport chain that allows us to generate ATP energy from the oxygen that we breathe, okay? So the Cristae, you see how beautiful the structure is. Uh, these are very sophisticated organelles. Uh, they can generate tremendous amounts of energy in the presence of oxygen to keep all of our tissues alive and our cell or brain and, and our cells uh, uh, participatory in metabolic homeostasis. Now, this is a glioblastoma, a very deadly brain cancer. I'll talk more about that later. But you can see it's hollow. It's crystallysis. There's a breakdown. There's no cristae. 
So this organelle is not going to be able to generate energy because the structure is abnormal. And I'll show you more evidence for this, not just brain cancer. Here's a, an example of breast cancer. This is a, uh, these are breast tumor cells and these are normal um, breast epithelial cells. And you can see the normal cell here has the nice stripes, the cristae, whereas the, the mitochondrion and the breast tumor has these big holes, these uh, crystallosis, abnormal cristae. Um, this here, CRC is colorectal cancer. Uh, you can see the, the, uh, crystal, the, these ghost mitochondria. So structure in biology, the, the, a fundamental evolutionary concept of biology that you can all, that everyone should be able to appreciate is structure determines function. Structure determines function. If the structure of the organelle is abnormal, the function of the organelle will be abnormal, okay? So what I did, and I don't expect people to see this because it's quite dense, but these are all of the major cancers that we know of, lung cancer, neuroblast, pancreatic, ovarian, colorectal, breast, whatever. You know, I went through the literature and detailed in all of these major cancers that mitochondria were abnormal in structure and function. Structure determines function. If the structure is abnormal, the function will be abnormal. If the mitochondria structure is abnormal, the function of that organelle will be abnormal. That the role of that organelle is to generate energy through respiration. So if you can't generate energy through respiration, in order to survive, the, the cell must ferment. So let's look at energy a little bit here. This is energy metabolism in normal cells. The glycolysis pathway breaks glucose down to pyruvic acid or pyruvate, a 10 step. This is an ancient pathway that existed in all cells before oxygen came into the atmosphere 2.5 billion years ago. So this is an ancient, ancient pathway, but it presents, uh, breaks down the sugar glucose, the pyruvate enters the mitochondria and is fully oxidized in the Krebs cycle, named for Hans Krebs, also the TCA cycle, citric acid cycle, the same names for the same thing. And what it does is it collects the energy from the sun that was in, in the bonds of the glucose molecule breaks the these bonds down, captures the energy of the sun in these uh, reducing equivalents, which then deliver their electrons to the proteins in the cristae, the electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorylation, and you see this large starburst here, ATP. So the most of the energy coming in our cells, 89 to 90% energy, is coming from the full oxidation of glucose down and the waste products are CO2 and water, okay? So this is the way most of all healthy cells in our body get majority of their energy. We all breathe air. Uh, we generate energy from the foods that we eat. We break it down. The foods that we eat embody the, the biology of the sun. the sun. The sun actually creates this. We break those bonds down, recapture the energy of the sun in, in respiration and we get the majority of our energy here. Now you don't see these small starbursts here these, um, this is the way all cells got energy before oxygen came into the atmosphere. These little ancient pathways, you can get, they still, they're still there. They're still present in modern cells. It's just that they're very, very much less energy. Most of the energy now is coming from respiration. Now let's compare this with what we see in a cancer cell. So now immediately, the first thing you see is the starburst is somewhere else. It's here. It's here from a different source. And it's also here in the cytoplasm. So the ancient pathways are now producing the majority of the energy. The oxidative phosphorylation is not producing the energy because the organelle, the cristae are gone. So you're not gonna get the energy here. So the cell, the cancer cell falls back on these ancient pathways that existed before oxygen came into the atmosphere. The interesting thing is when they do that, they become completely growth dysregulated. And the waste products, lactic acid and succinic acid, acidify the microenvironment of the tumor cell, making the spread of the tumor cell through the tissues uh, uh, much greater because of all the waste that's now creating acidification, which doesn't occur in the normal cells. You don't get any of this. So the cancer cell is simply falling back on ancient pathways, acidifying the microenvironment. And this is driven, these fuels are driven. Here's glucose. And what's driving here is the glutamine. The glutamine, the amino acid glutamine is driving this part, part and the 
uh, sugar, glucose is driving this part. So the abnormal energy of the cancer cell is being driven by glucose and glutamine, not by oxygen, because they lost that ability. Now, this is more complicated, but this is the uh, uh, structural uh, example of what we're talking about. Uh, here's glycolysis, the ancient pathway of glycolysis and glutaminolysis. Um, and uh, what's happening here, uh, glucose is metabolized to lactic acid, which acidifies the microenvironment. Um, but very little ATP is coming here. I, I'll, I can explain if anybody's interested. Here's the glutamine, the amino acid. It comes through a series of pathways. Uh, and right here, boom, here's the energy coming from glutamine. So glutamine is generating the majority of the energy. The oxygen, cancer cells do take in oxygen, but they're not linked to ATP production, but rather to the production of ROS, ROS, which are reactive radicals that damage DNA and RNA and actually cause a tremendous amount of damage. So, uh, and then succinate is dumped out to acidify the microenvironment, lactic acid is dumped out. So the cancer cell is driven by, by glucose and glutamine, producing energy by an ancient pathway, also producing reactive oxygen species, uh, causing uh, a tremendous amount of damage in the microenvironment. So here's our diagram uh, to encapsulate how we link the hallmarks of cancer according to the gene theory and Hanahan and Weinberg, all of these hallmarks here on the right can all be linked back to damage to the mitochondria. So let's look carefully at the origin of cancer. So everyone, we call certain chemicals as carcinogens, like in smoke, uh, there's a lot of carcinogens in, in, in cigarette and tobacco smoke, and we know that that can damage mitochondria. Carcinogens damage the mitochondria. People fear radiation because radiation can cause cancer uh, by damaging uh, mitochondria. Intermittent hypoxia, like sleep apnea and occlusion of a blood vessel or something, can create intermittent <clears throat> hypoxia, which will damage the mitochondria, okay? Um, systemic inflammation can damage the mitochondria. Um, obesity uh, is linked to systemic inflammation. Um, obesity, <coughs> excuse me, is the second most, uh, behind smoke, cigarette smoke is the most uh, provocative agent for damaging uh, mitochondria. Uh, rare, rare inherited mutations like the BRCA1 gene, you heard about Angelina Jolie with the BRCA1 having, you know, breasts and ovaries removed or what have you. A lot of women, a lot of people, many, not everyone, but some people do this. Um, so these mutations are risk factors. They, they are risk factors because they damage the respiration. All of these provocative agents are risk factors. Oncogenic viruses like papilloma and hepatitis they damage the respiration and also age. The older you get, the more likely you can have a, a damage to your respiration leading to um, uh, disruption of oxidative phosphorylation. And this had been known for many years. This was called the oncogenic paradox because no one could figure out how all of these disparate risk factors could cause cancer uh, through a common pathophysiological mechanism. And if those of you who read the book, Emperor of All Maladies, by Sid Mukherjee, which was on the New York Times bestseller list for many years, and was the uh, received the Pulitzer Prize uh, for the for the book. Um, he struggles with this. He had no idea, as Mukherjee in the book, how all these different provocative agents could can could cause cancer through a common pathophysiological mechanism. And we we define we we solve the par the paradox. Uh, we know that all of these provocative agents will cause reactive oxygen species, ROS. And this, uh, these ROS are carcinogenic and mutagenic. So the ROS cause the mutations in the nucleus, all right? So the mutations are an effect. They're not the cause. They're a downstream effect of mitochondrial damage. But when the mitochondria can't produce energy through oxidative phosphorylation, they upregulate fermentation through substrate level phosphorylation. And what happens is what is upregulating SLP uh, fermentation? And it is the oncogenes. So the oncogenes are facilitators of the fermentation process. They allow the cell to take in more glucose and glutamine. So um, when you can't breathe, 
the, 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 if, this, if a cell doesn't die right away, but it's chronic, it's a chronic progression over time, the cell gradually upregulates fermentation. You get the Warburg effect and mitochondrial fermentation. Okay. And now you can link all of the hallmarks of cancer that people think are, are really important are all downstream effects of damage to the mitochondria. So we're spending millions of dollars and spending massive amounts of scientific research on, on these hallmarks that all can be linked back to damage to the respiration. And now that we know this, we, there are very clear ways that by which we can solve this cancer problem quite effectively. And here, and as I said, we published this paper uh, on the origin of ATP synthesis in cancer because without ATP, cancer cells can't grow. Without ATP, none of the cells can grow. So the first thing you wanna do is where does the energy come from that drives the beast, which is the cancer? And it's coming from fermentation. So again, normal mitochondria have the nice stripes, the cristae. We get most of our energy by breathing air. We have very little risk of cancer. However, as the damage this, to this organelle occurs over time, uh, you can see here's the final result, which is a complete damage to the mitochondria. And you get uh, the transformation from respiration energy in the green to red uh, substrate level phosphorylation which is directly correlated with malignancy. The more malignant the cancer is, the more it ferments. The more malignant, the more it ferments, the more malignant it is, all right? What's driving the fermentation? Glucose and glutamine are driving the fermentation. So this malignancy is directly related to fermentation driven by glucose and glutamine. Now let's look at metastasis, all right? Because this is the most fearsome, ap fearful, abset as they say, fearsome aspect of cancer. 90% of all cancer deaths are due to the fact that the cancer cells, which start in some tissue or organ, now begin to spread through your body. And that's what's referred to as when someone says, oh, I have stage four cancer. Stage four cancer means it's already spread. It has metastasized. It has spread to different organs. The, and the first uh, uh, linkage of, of a metastasis to a non-random, it's actually a non-random process, 1889, this person, Stephen Paget, was studying breast cancer, showed that breast cells uh, spread to organs in, in a non-random way. He referred to the cancer cells as seeds and, and the, where they go, the soil, to what the soil is like, you know, liver, kidney, spleen, these other organs. And um, the seed soil, we solved the seed soil hypothesis by showing that the seeds are like mitochondria uh, or correction, macrophage is a different kind of cell, and I'll discuss this in a minute. And they do they do a non-random uh, spread through the body. So here's the, here's a picture of metastasis, uh, an artwork uh, that was produced. The green cells here are the cancer cells. Okay, so these are the green the green cells are your cancer cells, um, and this is the non-random metastatic cascade, a non-random metastatic cascade. Because if you have colon cancer, breast cancer, um, um, ovarian cancer, the process is, it follows this cascade. The first thing that happens is the cancer cells bust through the basement membrane and they sp start to locally invade uh, the tissue from where they started, a local invasion. The second step is intravisation, which means they enter into the bloodstream. They go through the blood vessel wall and enter into the bloodstream. They are not killed by the immune system because as I will show you, they are part of the immune system. So they're immune. not only are they not uh, killed by the immune system, they actually suppress our immune system to be dysfunctional. That's because these cells, and I'll show you, they are part of the immune system. They're macrophages actually. And then what happens, they get into the bloodstream and they spread through and it's called extravasation. They exit the blood vessels. These are all extremely sophisticated biological processes that cannot occur through random mutations. The randomness makes no sense when you're looking at a non-random uh, cascade. So they extravasate and they set up secondary tu tumor formation. So if this were a breast tumor, breaks through the basal membrane, gets into the bloodstream, and then you'll get the tumor cells in the lung, the spleen, uh, sometimes the brain, different, different organs. So the question, how can accumulation of random somatic mutations, according to the somatic mutation theory, cause a non-random medicine? None of this, when you start to understand what cancer is, everything associated with the somatic mutation theory makes no sense. Yet the field continues to embrace the somatic mutation theory. Now here's the way we get metastatic cancer. So here's uh, normal epithelial cells, could be in the breast, it could be in the lung, it could be somewhere. Uh, one of the provocative agents, um, risk factors, causes a uh, abnormality 
in the mitochondria, leading to dysregulated cell growth. But these cells can't spread anywhere. They are cancer cells, stem cells. They, by growing, they create abnormality in the microenvironment, which our body uh, recognizes as a wound. Cancer is recognized as a unhealed wound. Now the red cells are, are wound healing cells. They're called macrophages. Their job in our body is to kill bacteria and heal wounds. So they see these blue cells as a wound. So they come in and they throw out various growth factors that will try to, to heal wounds, but that's the wrong context. Those growth factors cause these blue cells, uh, uh, incipient cancer cells to become even more destabilized in their growth. And these macrophages have a capacity, if the wound doesn't heal right away, they have a very powerful fusogenic property where they actually fuse with other cells to facilitate wound healing. So what happens now is the macrophage that was designed in our, by our body to heal the wound fuses with these cancer cells, diluting the mitochondria in these cells to become abnormal. Now these macrophages already have the capacity to intravasate, extravasate, suppress the immune system. This is the origin of, of our metastatic cells. It's a fusion hybridization between one of the normal cells in our body with one of these abnormally dysregulated cells that cannot metastasize. This is a local event, but to get this, the, the local event to become systemic, there's this fusion hybridization. And these cells now enter and exit the nerve. So you get rogue macrophages spreading all around your body, driven by glucose and glutamine. These cells are absolutely dependent on glucose and glutamine for their survival to make ATP, right? So you don't need new mutations. So all this mutation stuff is just a, a deviation. So if most cancer cells obtain energy through fermentation, you know, what therapies might be effective for managing and preventing tumors? Well, one approach is to reduce levels of fermentable fuels while elevating levels of non-fermentable fuels, not complicated. So what we do here, if the tumor cell absolutely needs glucose for its rapid growth, you've got to lower systemic glucose. You got to just reduce the sugar and you elevate fuels that the tumor cells can't use. So our normal cells are great at using fatty acids and ketone bodies. The tumor cells cannot use these fuels because they cannot be fermented. They have to be respired. So the tumor cell becomes at a competitive disadvantage when you lower the fuels that are absolutely needed. Water only fasting, calorie restriction, or ketogenic diets all will lower blood sugar levels, elevating ketones, which the tumor cells can't use. Okay, so we developed the glucose ketone index uh, calculator. It's just a simple tool to monitor. Now this was for brain cancer, monitor, monitor therapeutic efficacy for brain cancer, but it, we now know all, all of the major cancers suffer the same problem. All the major cancers need glucose and glutamine. So, but for lowering glucose, and elevating ketones, which puts most cancer cells in a defensive position, we, we, we built this little simple calculator. And you, Keto Mojo is, a, is the meter that you can buy from uh, Amazon, and it will measure blood sugar and blood ketones. And if you can get a ratio, uh, the GKI ratio of 2.0 or below, you are now putting your body, the, the body into a state of nutritional ketosis, which is depriving the tumor cell of the, of the glucose needed to grow. Uh, it doesn't target the glutamine, but it certainly can tell you what stage you're in for targeting or reducing the glucose to the tumor growth. Now, what we've done is we produced this press pulse uh, concept. It's a no novel therapeutic strategy for me metabolic management of cancer. And um, when patients enter the clinic, uh, not only do they have cancer, but many cancer patients, not all, but many, have comorbidities, hypertension, high blood pressure, type two diabetes, they have all of these other maladies. So in order to move the patient from a, a, a very critical stage to a less critical stage, we in, introduce uh, restricted ketogenic diet therapy, ketone supplementation, uh, attempts to press down the availability of the glucose. We also use stress management. Um, when people are diagnosed with cancer, they have this impending a doom, uh, a feeling that they're all going to be dead and they're going to die and they're going to suffer and all this kind of stuff. And that raises blood sugar. Anxiety raises blood sugar. So what we do is stress management together with uh, a diet th therapeutic approach to lower the, the glucose and elevate the ketones. And once the patient is in a state of nutritional ketosis, 
then we do pulse therapies. We don't ever want to treat patients with toxic levels of drugs. Uh, it's you pulse them. You, you, once the patient is in this, you begin to pulse glucose drugs that target glucose, like uh, embendazole, the parasite medication, and fenbendazole. Glutamine uh, uh, targeting with Don and glutamine, uh, um, I'll talk about that in a minute. And hyperbaric oxygen, which creates oxidative stress without toxicity. I mean, you can, you can use radiation to create oxidative stress, but that radiation also damages your normal tissue. We don't want that. We want to use therapies that will achieve the same goal without damaging your normal tissues. There should be no reason why people should ever be exposed to all kinds of toxic therapies to make themselves healthy. So what happens now is we bring the patient into a state of management. Um, the patient still has tumors, but we gradually remove comorbidities, like I've mentioned. Um, and then through uh, perfections of dosage, timing, and scheduling with these press pulse therapies, we can then move the patient from a state of management, either into a very long-term management or even possible uh, resolution. And this is the cutting edge right now. What is the best dosage, timing, and therapies that can achieve long-term management, high quality of life, and possible uh, resolution. This is a work in progress. It's the cutting edge, and this will be the future of how we're going to manage the majority of cancers. Now, I'm going to talk specifically about one type of cancer, glioblastoma, um, which is among the most aggressive uh, primary brain tumors, very poor prognosis. Um, me, um, median survival is only about 10 to 15 months, uh, composed of many different cell types, neoplastic stem cells, neoplastic mesenchymal cells with macrophage characteristics. As I said, this is the rogue macrophage, the most deadly and difficult aspect responsible for metastasis. And they can also metastasize outside the nervous system and in some people. So we're really dealing with a very difficult disease. Um, usually it's always considered terminal, incurable, uh, all of these kinds of terms, you're hopeless, you hear all these kinds of terms when you discuss this. So here's a gross section of a person's brain who died from glioblastoma. You can see the massive discoloration, cystic regions. You see that here's the midline, the midline of the brain is shifted to the left, should be nice and straight. As the tumor grew, uh, what happens to these poor folks is that the intracranial pressure from the expanding tumor uh, will eventually cause unconsciousness and death. Um, this tumor was irradiated, this massive discoloration here. And what happened, why you can't cure these things with uh, surgery um, is because the tumor cells have already spread through the whole brain. And these dark purple cells that you see on the right here in this image, these are the tumor cells around blood vessels. And they use the blood vessels as a railway system to move through the entire brain. So even the surgeon could take, say, well, we got nine, we got most of it, of course, but you didn't get all of it, and the all of and the rest of it is out through the brain, and um, and then it'll come back uh, always. Um, and here's the survival statistics of glioblastoma patients um, under current standards of care from five Canadian, Canadian surgical institutions. But I want to tell you, this is not unique for these five institutions. It's seen in every major uh, oncology clinic throughout the world. The survival is abysmal. This is 40 months. Um, and you can see most of the patients in these institutions have expired uh, before 40 months. Um, this one institution, I, I don't know, this seems to be if the patients die faster in that institution, but the other four, but this is pretty much similar all throughout the world in all different clinics. Um, uh, you know, th this, there's no improvement in, in survival for glioblastoma in almost 100 years. 1926, they, they, they had the same survival for glioblastoma as we have now in, 20, in 2022. Now think about it for a minute. Think of all of the advances in science and technology that have occurred over the last 100 years, okay? So we have the Webb telescope, which is now orbiting 1 million miles from Earth, uh, 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 which is looking now at the origin uh, uh, of the universe uh, with this new type, type of te telescope. The science and technology over the last 100 years in almost all aspects of our, of our society has, in, has improved significantly, yet no advance in the survival of GBM and what is going on? What can account for the lack of progress in managing glial, in fact, many of the metastatic cancers, we've done a very poor job. 
And, and one of the reasons, at least for glioblastoma and, and for others as well, is the, uh, the way we treat the, the tumor. Okay, so the patient is diagnosed, they do surgical debulking, and right after surgical debulking, uh, radiotherapy uh, is given to the patients. And radiotherapy breaks apart glucose and glutamine um, uh, metabolism in the brain, uh, creates massive inflammation uh, from the surgery, as well as the radiation, especially the radiation. As when the brain is irradiated, the uh, head swells, your head gets hot, your brain gets hot, you swell. So in order to reduce the swelling from the radiation, the zone is steroid, which creates hyperglycemia. Uh, hyperglycemia is high blood sugar. As I said, the can cancer cell cannot live without, without sugar. So the very treatment creates, the radiation itself creates a high in, in, increase in blood sugar. The dexamethasone used to reduce the swelling creates high blood sugar. The radiation breaks apart the glutamine glutamate cycle, freeing up massive amounts of glutamine. So the two fuels that are driving cancer, glutamine and glucose, are produced in large quantities by the very procedures used to manage the disease. Not only that, these tumor cells, the glioblastoma tumor cells, are many patients are infected with human cytomegalovirus, human cytomegalovirus, which is a, acts as a turbocharger in the tumor cells to use glutamine and glucose. So the two fuels driving the cancer cells are massively produced by the very therapy that's used to treat the disease. Okay, which can which now can which now explains. Uh, the problem. So um, you don't survive. Uh, there's two reasons. First of all, the tumor is bad by itself. There's no question about that. And second of all, the very treatment used to, to, to manage the tumor contributes to the rapid demise uh, and the rapid acceleration of uh, patients' uh, reduced survival. And um, so it's clear why we haven't made any progress. Number one, the tumor is bad. They don't understand that it's a metabolic disease, not a genetic disease. And the very treatment that we're using contributes to the rapid recurrence and demise of the patients. And as Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. As long as we continue to treat the patients in the clinic, the way we are treating them, this survival curve will, will not change. This will be the way it is for well into the future, as long as we can continue to do what we're doing in the way we try to manage the disease. So um, to give you an idea of how we use press pulse therapy to manage um, preclinical glioblastoma, uh, we have this tumor that we have in the mouse that replicates all of the invasive characteristics of the human glioblastoma, powerful tool. Um, we tested our hypothesis that the, com that, the, that, the, that the targeting of glutamine and glucose together will provide a rational approach for the long-term management of the disease. And we published this paper in Commun Communications Biology. This is the first paper study showing how we can use a diet and a drug together to target simultaneously the availability of the glucose and glutamine, the two fuels absolutely essential for the growth of the tumor cells, okay? So here's the histology, just so you can see how powerful this is. A standard diet unrestricted, S-D-U-R, is the mice that ate a high carbohydrate standard diet. The ketogenic diet restricted is the high fat, low carbohydrate diet presented and fed in restrict amounts. And the ketogenic diet restricted plus Don, and that's the, the, the previous drug that I wanna show you. Here it is, 6-diazo uh, nor leucine. This drug was used in the cancer clinic years ago it wasn't considered, uh, it was really good in children with leukemia, uh, but it wasn't so good in other uh, cancers. Uh, they said it had toxicity um, and it wasn't able to resolve cancer. Well, they never targeted the glucose and they gave the drug in, in very high concentrations. So you have to know what to do. You can't just do stuff without understanding the biology of the disease. So we combined the glutamine inhibitor together with the ketogenic restricted diet uh, to achieve uh, remarkable success in managing uh, this glioblastoma. So here, now, if you look at here, you see this dark blue on the left, those are the rapidly growing uh, glioblastoma cells and the, they're coming, migrating, re invading, they're invading deeply into the white part of the normal part of the brain. And when you look at them at a higher power, you can see the cells are piled on top of each other. They can't, they can't grow, they can't grow any faster than they are growing. Now you give them the ketogenic diet by itself and you see the white, the, the, there's much less density 
and they're not invading as much into the normal part of the brain. This is the, the, the wider area. And you can see spacing. So the cells are there, they're dividing, they're still growing, but they're not growing as fast. So the restricted ketogenic diet, which is targeting glucose, is causing the cells to grow less aggressively. But now when you combine the diet with the drug, all, this is all dead cells. These are all the tumor cells that are now dead. Um, massive death of the tumor cells. So you slaughtered these tumor cells. So they cannot survive without the glucose and the glutamine. The diet targets the glucose, the drug Don targets the glutamine, and together you can slaughter and, and remove these tumor cells, uh, get rid of them. And here, the most important thing of any cancer therapy and treatment is two things, quality of life and overall survival. Those, that's, the, that's how you determine whether or not something is working. If you take drugs and things and you say, well, my tumor is shrinking, but I, I feel I'm sick all the time and I feel horrible. The but you really want quality of life and overall survival. So this is what we have demonstrated by using press pulse uh, diet drug combination. So this blue line here, look how fast the mice will die if just allowed to eat the high carbohydrate diet. So you can see uh, very quickly, just like the, of course, the mouse metabolic rate is seven times faster than that of a human. So you can see them, they die very quickly over a few days. Whereas the humans you saw, they, they don't survive much beyond um, you know, three, in the case of humans, three years in the GBM. Um, but now you take, okay, so the, the, the guys eating the high carb diets die quick because they have plenty of glucose and glutamine. The guys getting the ketogenic diet restricted live a little bit longer, but they all die too. So you're, you're shutting down the glucose, but not the glutamine. Then you use the high carbohydrate with Don, the glutamine inhibitor, and they survive a little bit better, but they're all dead as well. Now you, pay, you take the diet and the drug together and you get long-term survival. The qual these guys look very healthy. And now we're, with doses, timing, and scheduling, we're keeping these guys alive much longer. And it really works well against pediatric glioblastoma, pe these very deadly uh, childhood brain tumors. I'm telling you, this diet-drug combination is really very effective, non-toxic, and can keep the... Why? Because we're targeting the very the nature of what the tumors need. So, and the other uh, remarkable phenomenon that we found is that when you deliver the drug Don together with the ketogenic diet, this is electro, uh, 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 liquid chromatography mass spectral analysis of the drug in the, in the, in the brain uh, near the tumor. And what you see here is that uh, you get much more drug on target when you deliver the drug with the ketogenic diet restricted. So this is really, uh, really remarkable. So the, the ketogenic diet facilitates drug delivery to the tumor. Now let's see what happens when we try it on human. Okay, let's see, let's do press pulse therapy uh, for the metabolic management of glioblastoma in a patient. So this young man came into the clinic and uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. El Saka from Alexandria, Egypt, uh, read our work and said, oh, we have to definitely do metabolic therapy for uh, patients in the clinic. So he said, uh, uh, okay. So we, we looked at this young man. He was a corn farmer. He came in to the clinic and his whole left side of his body was paral paralyzed. He, his leg didn't work, his left leg and his arm. And he had a glioblastoma on MRI imaging analysis. So the patient was uh, fasted water only for three days. And then for 21 days, given a very low carbohydrate diet uh, 900 kilocalories. And uh, then the tumor was, so we had three weeks of, a uh, little over three weeks of, of metabolic treatment. And then his tumor was removed in an awake uh, craniotomy. And when he was, when he recovered, <clears throat> um, he was continued to uh, give intermittent fasting, uh, restricted diets with hyperbaric oxygen therapy um, uh, for, for three months. He was doing remarkably well. I mean, he was back walking, you know, he was up and around, he was back home. Uh, then he had to go, do this um, radiation. So I said to Dr. El Saka, why are we doing radiation on this patient uh, when he's doing so well? And he said, well, this is the standard of care. We have to do this. We have no choice, uh, whether, whether you're in any clinic in the United States or uh, anywhere in the world, they do radiation and, and chemo. And the chemo is tenozolomide, TNZ. Uh, a toxic alkylating agent. So we get, but we still kept him on the diet, did hyperbaric oxygen, radiation, and temozolomide um, for nine months over a nine month period. Um, and then he went back after the treatment, uh, three months on a low carbohydrate. He was doing great MRIs. Everything looked, 
everything looked pretty good. He, he handled all of these treatments uh, really well. Um, and as you can see here, the glucose ketone index, we brought it down to the therapeutic zone, 15 months, he was doing really well. Here's the tumor in his brain. Um, you can see the tumor here, this white part, and you can see the big shift to the right, the midline shift, the red line is shifted from the tumor. But as the tumor begins to shrink from the treatment, the midline shift straightens out. Uh, yeah, he went back. The guy was doing really well. He was back out in the, in the farm uh, doing his uh, work in the, in the corn. He was a corn farmer. And then at about, um, I think it was 28, 29 months, uh, he started to complain of headaches. Um, and then unfortunately at 30 months, the patient uh, expired and uh, they did a, a, an autopsy and, and they found that his brain, uh, it was called uh, radiation, uh, radiation nec necrosis liquefaction. So he seemed to die from liquefaction of his brain from the radiation treatment. Uh, the pathologist said he didn't see tumor cells. So it looked like it was all radiation damage. Um, so that's when we decided to uh, 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 maybe ketogenic therapy should become the standard of care for glioblastoma uh, rather than toxic radiation and, and, and what they're presently doing. And I published this paper with my colleagues, uh, clearly, clearly documenting how the standard of care is actually contributing to the rapid recurrence and growth of the tumor leading to the demise of the patients and why we're not making any major progress in managing glioblastoma because we continue to use the same uh, treatment that uh, facilitates the re uh, uh, that facilitates the presence of glucose and glutamine and if you don't target glucose and glutamine these tumor cells will grow will always grow very rapidly so it's my opinion that the replacement of the current standard of care radiation and chemo with ketogenic metabolic therapy will improve quality of life and overall survival of most GBM patients, okay? And now we'll look at individual uh, pictures. I've shown this before, uh, Brittany Maynard. Uh, interestingly enough, she was diagnosed with glioblastoma in January uh, of 14, 2014. She also, at first, when they did the biopsy, said, said oh, she had a low-grade tumor. Uh, that's really good because you're supposed to live uh, much longer with a low-grade stage two. But they, uh, uh, one month after they did the biopsy, the tumor exploded into a glioblastoma. Um, and that's what I call uh, the influence of an inflammatory oncotaxis. You disturb the microenvironment causing the tumor to explode into a, a, a glioblastoma. Um, you know, she, here, here's her picture right after she got married. She was a big article in People Magazine, My Decision to Die. Uh, she was from California. She, Oregon, the, the, state, the next state up north um, has a right to die, death with dignity. So you're allowed to take your own life uh, if you are confronted with a terminal uh, disease uh, like she was with glioblastoma. So here she is uh, 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 before she died. And you can see her face doesn't look like it looks here. This swollenness is from high dose steroids. It's called moon face. And that's a characteristic that this young lady was given high dose steroids to try to reduce the inflammation in her brain. And we know that high dose steroids will increase the level of glucose so that it's actually driving the growth of her tumor uh, in an attempt to reduce the inflammation. And this is another tragic case, Danny Sheehan. Uh, he just recently passed away in 2021. He was a, a young man from here near Boston. And uh, he had a pineoblastoma, which is similar to adult glioblastoma, but it occurs in kids. And he was diagnosed in 2017 uh, with this tumor. And you can see him shortly before he died. His face is completely swollen from the steroids, the high dose steroids that they gave to this little guy uh, in an attempt to reduce the inflammation. And we know that the high dose steroids will contribute to the rapid uh, tumor growth. Um, now here's another case. This is uh, Pablo Kelly. Uh, we published this paper last year. Uh, Pablo uh, contact, he also was diagnosed with terminal glioblastoma in 2014, just like Brittany. Um, uh, he, he went to the clinic. He was having seizures and headaches and things like this. <clears throat> and they said, uh, they did the histology and said, you have a glioblastoma, a terminal uh, uh, cancer. And, um, but he himself, he, re he resisted the strong arm tactics of his clinical team to do radiation and chemo. He said, no. 
I don't want to do that. And he said, well, you're going to be dead in nine months if you don't do that. So no radiation, no chemo, no steroids. Um, so Pablo contacted me and I said, you know, I just said, told him, I said, well, you know, you can try metabolic therapy, see what happens. Um, so he, he shifted. He didn't do radiation chemo and he, he went on a very low carb, zero carbohydrate diet, more like a, a carnivore diet, actually. But it was still quite, quite low in carbs. And now he's still living. I, I, he has a web, a web page. You can talk to Pablo and ask him questions about, you know, his, his story and what he's done. Um, he's out now almost 90 months, uh, eight years, I guess, will be August. He'll be out eight years survival. Um, but there's a bigger story behind why he's, why he's alive. And uh, uh, let, let me tell you about this. So, so what Pablo did, and we have five years of detailed uh, information on how he measured his blood glucose and ketones uh, many times a day, uh, several times a week, depending on the situation. Uh, his blood glucose and ketones were managed well. His GKI was 2.0 or below. Look at, and he was very aggressive. Now, then three years after initiating the metabolic therapy, he decided his tumor continued to grow. We didn't cure his cancer. All we did was slow down his, the rate of growth. And by three years after his diagnosis in 2017, uh, he decides to have a debulking surgery. He never had surgery at the beginning. Um, he just did metabolic therapy. So after three years, he, he reduced the size of his tumor. He thought he was cured, but then the tumor started growing again slowly. And he went back on the metabolic therapy, uh, a carnivore kind of, a, that's not so debilitating. You know, he's eating steaks and lamb with butter on it and things like this. You can talk to him on his webpage. Um, and then uh, the tumor was managed. And just recently last year, he had a second debulking surgery. And, um, you know, he's going through these pr procedures, uh, but he's still alive and he has a, a good quality, generally a, a good quality of life. And uh, he, he did metabolic therapy alone. Now, the, here's the situation. And I know this is complicated, but there's several reasons for why Pablo is still alive with a terminal glioblastoma. Number one, he rejected standard of care. Okay, that's number one. Number two, he went on a metabolic therapy. Uh, number three, his tumor had this mutation called IDH1 mutation. This is a, uh, I call it a gift from God. Uh, it's, a, it's just a, 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 a random mutation, but the mutation acts as a drug that targets the glycolysis and glutaminolysis pathways. So it's a therapeutic mutation that some people with glioblastomas get. Uh, it, it's not known how or why, but the, but the, but the answer is, is that we know that that mutation uh, uh, restricts the glycolytic pathway and the glutaminolysis pathway, thereby shutting down the availability of glucose and glutamine to the tumor. This together with his young age, this together with his metabolic therapy, all together are keeping him alive um, for all these different reasons. So our bodies naturally can, can randomly produce or acquire, acquire a mutation, that actually acts as a drug and together with the diet. I mean, we put it all together and this guy is just very fortunate to not take radiation and chemo and to be very fortunate in acquiring a mutation that acts as a drug targeting glucose and glutamine, if you can believe it. So uh, GBM and other stage four cancers should not be considered terminal if treated with ketogenic metabolic therapy. This gives the opportunity uh, for patients to uh, and, and overall, potentially overall better survival. So uh, my, the paper that we wrote, uh, can the mitochondrial metabolic theory explain better the origin and management of cancer than can the somatic mutation theory? Absolutely. Uh, you read this paper, I understand it could be kind of difficult. There's some scientific literacy that's required, but we set up the thing. So the geocentric theory says that the earth is the center of the solar system, the sun and all the planets revolve around the earth. Um, as you can see, this was complicated for centuries. The, the orbitals were, uh, were very confusing, but when the sun was placed in the center of the solar system, the orbits of all the planets made a, a, a much greater amount of sense and could be much more easily explained. So we, we consider the geocentric theory comparable to the somatic mutation theory, a real mess of confusion in trying to manage cancer because instead of putting the, the, here's where the nucleus is the center of the disease. And here's where the mitochondria becomes the center of the disease. The mitochondrial metabolic theory, it can explain better the origin and management of cancer than can the somatic mutation theory. 
So it is not clear how many years or decades it will take for the cancer field to recognize that the mitochondrial metabolic theory can explain better uh, the origin and management of cancer. I don't know how long it's going to take. Um, people just have to know about it. So the conclusions, most cancers, including glioblastoma, and I didn't get a chance to talk about breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, but they're, they're, all the cancers are very similar. Uh, they all depend on glucose and glutamine. Cancer is not a genetic disease. So you have to realize this. It's not a genetic disease. It's a mitochondrial metabolic disease. Relying on substrate level phosphorylation uh, for energy. This is the hallmark of all the major cancers. The simultaneous restriction of glucose and glutamine will help manage most cancers. This will be the, the way we manage. The press pulse metabolic therapy is a non-toxic cost-effective strategy for the uh, management, possible management of most cancers, especially uh, glioblastoma. So we now, we now have a, a, a pathway uh, by which we can uh, move forward. I don't know how long it's gonna take for the, for the field to come to realize this, um, but the takeaways you can uh, start immediately was recommended by, um, uh, to, to put as our final slide. Uh, so cancer patients and their family members should ask these three simple questions of their oncologist. If anyone is, is diagnosed with cancer, number one, is the treatment you are proposing for me based on, is it based on the somatic mutation theory or on the mitochondrial metabolic theory? The oncologist should know this. Will the treatment you are proposing for me be able to reduce the availability of the two fuels, glucose and glutamine, that are driving the dysregulated growth of my cancer? Will the treatment you propose for me be able to target my cancer cells while enhancing the health and vitality of the normal cells and tissues of my body? So these three questions, all cancer patients have the opportunity to ask their, their oncologist because the answers to these questions could predict the ultimate destiny of the patient. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge the many uh, physicians and scientists who have been working with me over the years. We are attempting to from metabolic therapy. I know I'm the Chinese in China, they're very excited about this, um, or in Venezuela. In, in, in Brazil and many European countries, uh, we're getting to realize now that cancer is a metabolic disease with metabolic solutions that can reduce significantly toxicity and improve quality of life and overall survival. And of course, you know, to do our fundamental research, we need support. And the funding we get comes from a number of private foundations and, 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 the, and the, good, the good of individual people, uh, the goodwill of individual Metabolic Christofferson's, Travis Christofferson's Foundation for Metabolic Cancer Therapies. We support the George U Foundation, Dr. Joseph Maroon of Pittsburgh, Mr. Edward Miller, extremely important to support our work, the Kenneth Raynan Foundation, the CrossFit Organization has supported us, Children with Cancer, United Kingdom, a private foundation for pediatric uh, cancers are supporting our work, the university, my Boston College, uh, the Institute of um, metabol of uh, oral uh, um, 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 uh, and toxicology, and in the past, the NIH. And um, I will stop at this point and be able to answer any questions that uh, you might have. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Seafree, for that um, great, great presentation. Um, also, before we start the Q&A, um, if anyone wants to follow up with you or find any of your books, what's the best way to do that? Oh, well, you can email me um, and I'll be happy to address any questions or further information that you might have. Mm -hmm. So, okay, great. And we have your, your book up here too, if anyone wants to yeah. check out our site. Um, okay. All right. So um, before we get to the Q&A, uh, I just want to explain to everyone, um, Basically, how we do this, we don't take questions from the chat normally. Instead, we ask everyone to virtually raise your hand. Um, if you're not sure how to do this, you go to the bottom portion of your mm -hmm. Zoom window and hit the Reactions tab. Um, from there, another window should pop up that will have a raise hand icon. You click that, and then we will see that you have a raise hand in our participants window. Um, we will take then the questions in the order in which you receive them. When it's your turn, we will unmute you and prompt you to ask your question. And uh, with that, are you ready to start the questions, doctor? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Okay, first we have, 
Okay. We have Steve. Okay. Oh. Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Seifried. Um, are you, you're saying to a, that glucose is feeding cancer. So does that mean, what does that mean in terms of one, should we eat fruit? Two, should we eat beans because do they turn to sugar? And three, what about whole grains because do they turn to sugar? Well, they can in some people uh, more than others. I mean, you measure your glucose ketone index will tell you what you can and cannot eat. It's very simple. You get the meter, you take your blood measurements. And if it says that beans make your blood sugar go high, don't eat beans. I mean, you, you can make, every person can make the decision for themselves based on their GKI, the glucose ketone index. What about fruit though? I don't measure your GKI and see what happens. Uh, you know, uh, grapefruit is very low glycemic. Uh, uh, an orange could be much higher. Again, measure your GKI. Your answer will be given to you by your, your GKI, which could vary from one person to the next. It's not constant. Oh, one person may not be what a person can. So the way to know what you can or cannot eat, you measure your GKI. Thank you. Okay, next we have Deborah. Deborah, what is your question for Dr. Seafried? Hi, yes, good morning. I wanted to ask, um, I understand the difference between when you have cancer and don't have cancer, maybe different protocols, but at this conference, there's of course a lot of talk and adopting of plant-based um, and vegans and vegetarian. And then um, today in this talk, having someone who has cancer and you're promoting or saying that part of the treatment would be the keto um, and achieving ketosis, um, quite often ketosis and keto is associated with eating lots of meat and vegetable protein. So I guess I have two questions. Um, uh, what I wanted to know, I guess, is, is there a way to achieve the ketosis and the good results still not eating meat or in the event that you get cancer, forget the vegan stuff, just go have a hamburger? No, no. Uh, I, again, it's the GKI. Um, you can be in ketosis on a completely vegan diet or on a carnivore diet. So again, like Pablo Kelly did, he was measuring his glucose ketone index and he was able to keep it 2.0 or below. Someone on a vegan diet could do the same thing. It's just that the food items that will keep you in ketosis uh, vary, uh, differ. Uh, again, it's mostly due to low carbohydrate. The lower the carbohydrate you have in the diet, the better you're gonna have a GKI value. And again, this is like the last question. Uh, we can't know that for each person unless they do their own measurements. And we find it varies tremendously what one person can eat, what the other person cannot eat. And it all comes down to, so if you're gonna be a vegan or a carnivore or whatever, as long as you can keep a low GKI, uh, then that is one way to um, reduce the rate of tumor growth. Okay, great. Next we have Yaron. Yaron, what is your question? Hi, uh, thank you for the great presentation, doctor. So I have uh, two quick questions. One, uh, does your research show that uh, the press pul pulse metabolic uh, therapy help also for uh, small cell cancer? And my second question, if a patient wants to get this treatment of press uh, pulse metabolic therapy, where he can find it and is it available for, for your knowledge in Israel? Well, again, um... Yeah, it works. It, it, all the cancers, all the, ma all the major cancers have the same problem. So small cell cancer is, the, has the, is dependent on glucose and glutamine as well. Um, colon, or rectal, all the major cancers. That if, you, if you look at our, our science paper, we, we went through all the major cancers. So they all need glucose and glutamine for the most part. Um, it, there are clinics that are opening up uh, slowly um, around the world and even in Israel. Uh, there are some folks. You, you just have to take those three questions that I put at the end and go to the oncologist and see how they answer those questions. And then you'll know whether or not you can use meta. If, they, if they're familiar with metabolic therapy for cancer, they should be able to provide you with accurate answers to those, to those questions. If they have never heard of metabolic therapy, they never know about Otto Warburg, they didn't know this, then you have to recognize that these people probably don't understand the biology of the disease. And then you, you, you have to make decisions based on that information. 
So yeah, I mean, different countries. The Turkish group in Istanbul, Turkey, is uh, embracing metabolic therapy, and they're getting quite quite good success on advanced uh, terminal cancers. So uh, again, a lot of people are going to the Istanbul clinic. There are certain clinics that are opening up in 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 uh, United States, but it's they're few and far between because most people go to their major oncology centers um, for information. And most of the ecology centers uh, uh, either don't know about it or don't accept it or whatever. So you just have to, you know, do your own investigation on that. All right. Thank you, Yaron, for that question. Thank you, doctor. Next, we have Wendy. Wendy, what is your question? Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, my question regarding press pulse therapy, are there any devices that one can afford to buy to have for their self? And otherwise, how do you find doctors that uh, use press pulse therapy and the uh, DOM or whatever that drug therapy is? Thank you. Yeah, well, the device would be the, the Keto Mojo um, blood glucose ketone meter. You can get it from Amazon. Um, uh, and the consumables, I mean, the meter itself is not that expensive. I don't know, maybe $60. Uh, but the consumables, the glucose, the glucose strips are cheap. The, the glutamine or the correction, the, the, the ketone strips are a little bit more expensive. Um, but you can use urine, urine uh, ketone strips in between the blood strips for, for ketone measurement. Um, whether, like, again, unfortunately, uh, what I've outlined is the future of cancer meta uh, uh, management. Um, you don't, you don't, see this in all the major clinics. And I, I'm surprised. They, they, some of the physicians hear about oncologists, a lot of them just don't um, know about it. And I think it's important. Who's, who's going to tell the oncology clinics that they want press pulse? If you go in and say, oh, listen, I, I have breast cancer, colon cancer, whatever. I'd like, I'd like press pulse metabolic therapy um, rather than radiation and chemo. Uh, uh, well, then you have to see what kind of response you get. Ask those three questions that I put at the end, and then you'll know right off the bat whether they can do that or not, and whether they want to do that or not. I'm it's sorry to interrupt. It's happening for brain cancer, but not for the other cancers. I, I'm sorry, I'm not clear. The met, I have the keto mojo, but the yeah. press pulse therapy. I don't know what you mean by that exactly. Okay. Are okay. there any things that we can buy ourselves I see. that would I see. provide that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So once you, what the way the clinics work, um, is that once the patient is in nutritional ketosis with a GKI of 2.0 or below, is when the patient would then be uh, given by a professional uh, physician uh, dosages of uh, of different drugs uh, that will target glucose and glutamine. So you need to uh, be aligned with a physician that can prescribe uh, these different approaches. And access to a hyperbaric oxygen chamber uh, is also part of this. And you will need to, uh, this is unfortunately, uh, there's no very few, if any clinics that really put this package together um, for helping the patients. And uh, it's going to be uh, uh, on the part of the patients to demand this. If they, if they want this, they're going to have to tell the, the oncologists or the, uh, the treating facility that uh, press pulse, we've clearly outlined what is needed to be done, how to do it. So it's uh, the part, on the part of the oncologist to read this information and adapt it into their, into their clinics. So um, once this happens, I think we're going to start seeing much greater uh, uh, improvement. But you're right. I mean, right now you say, well, what can I do? Can I go out and buy my own hyperbaric oxygen chamber? They're very expensive. I wouldn't do this. I would find a place where you could. And the other, the other problem is the insurance companies uh, will cover the cost of hyperbaric oxygen to improve your body after you've been irradiated, uh, but they don't approve it uh, for managing the cancer itself. So you have this insurance issue problem that also has to be resolved. So there is a number of, of, of situations that must be resolved. Even though the concepts and the strategy is clear for helping people live longer with cancer at a higher quality of life, the application of this is in its infancy and has not yet been fully recognized or adapted in the, in the various cancer clinics. And that's what will have to come from the pressure of the cancer patients to make sure those changes occur. 
Thank you. All right. Thank you for that, Wendy. Thank you, doctor. Um, next, we have Anne. Anne, what is your question? Hi, Dr. Seafried. Thank you for taking my call. I'm listening to you from Toronto. I was diagnosed two years ago with stage four high serous ovarian cancer. Um, they did a 10 hour surgery followed by five months of IV, IP chemo. I was on a very strict keto diet and my CA-125 numbers have remained very low um, around 10, 11, 11, 12. Um, and then gradually the last six months, I've gone a little bit more plant-based, introducing more beans and more um, grains. And listening to you today, obviously, I think you've answered my question. Um, the uh, GK um, I will indicate whether um, I'm in ketosis or not anymore. I think that was my question. Yeah, well, um, you know, just like what when I showed with Pablo Kelly uh, in his managing of his glioblastoma, um, you know, there is there is some um, slippage a little bit, but uh, he he has come into a new diet and lifestyle that kind of maintains, and I think maintains the <laughs> slow growth. Let's put it that way. Again, yes. he's not cured. Um, but he's, and like yourself, uh, uh, you know, at some point, if, if, if you can get access to the other parts of the press pulse, um, uh, strategy, uh, you can, you can, you can discuss this with your oncologists. If you, if you, now that you have this information, you can discuss this, uh, and discuss op options that may help you maintain, um, uh, a quality of life and, uh, a management of the tumor. So I think these, you, you have the, you have the, what I gave you, and now you can discuss this to see if you can continue to maintain a uh, very, very slow, if maybe resolution of your tumor, I don't know, but um, uh, at least that's what you can do. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Anne, for that. And now next we have Tony. Tony, what is your question? Uh, yes. Uh, last July, I was diagnosed with uh, low-grade uh, B-cell follicular which progressed to moderate diffuse large B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I've been on CHOP-R for four cycles. I've got two more to go, obviously the prednisone. And curious if this metabolic theory also applies to lymphomas. I see most of the, most of the lectures are about solid tumors. Yeah, lymphomas are the same as the others. Um, they're bathed in glutamine because they're in the blood. Um, and uh, when you look into the scientific literature, you'll see the, 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 the mitochondria in lymphomas, uh, um, uh, all, all the different blood cancers have defective uh, respiratory capacity. Therefore, therefore, they're based on fermentation, just like the solid tumors are. So um, yeah, I, I mean, it's remarkable when I looked into the scientific literature and, and looked at the mitochondria and all these cancers, they're all defective. And what that means is they have to use glucose and glutamine. So lymphomas, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, or even Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, they, they require glucose and glutamine. So uh, again, that's the common problem. Uh, and if you look at your treatment, CHOP, I mean, CHOP will, will, is a cocktail of toxic drugs that will break DNA, you know, stop uh, replication. Uh, yeah, you can get effective treatment for that, but also pulling the plug on the glucose and glutamine can do it without toxicity. I mean, you can manage cancer with toxic, really radical toxicity, of course, but at the same time, you put normal cells of your body at risk um, for damage from radiation and chemo, which is not healthy. Uh, on the other hand, you can manage the cancer by uh, selectively tar targeting glucose and glutamine using press pulse metabolic therapy. But as the questions I've said, most oncology, bring it up to your oncologist and say, can, you, can, you, can I do press pulse metabolic therapy and see what they say? Um, and then you'll, you'll know the answer to your, to your question. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tony. Next, we have Cheryl. Cheryl, what is your question? Hi, Dr. Seifried. Well, um, Tony just asked my main question, and I have a second question. But first, I just want to thank you so much for your work and your commitment to finding the real truth. So my question is, if someone has a watery cancer, like specifically double hit non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and he's been doing conventional standard of care treatment for over a year. I think it's mainly 
experimental chemo and he survived so far, can he benefit by switching to the metabolic therapy or does it ever become too late? Well, I don't, I don't think anything for the most part becomes too late. Uh, if the patient is still cognitive and still functional, um, you can always uh, integrate metabolic therapy. And, and I don't want to say that metabolic therapy alone uh, it should be used. I mean, there are many people who do conventional standards of care and they combine it with um, metabolic therapy uh, because, because in general, when you're into a state of water fasting or ketosis, the normal cells of your body get healthier. So you're always going to be uh, helping the normal cells do this and uh, can reduce uh, some of the toxicities of these powerful uh, toxic chemicals. The work of Longo um, has shown that people who are taking, uh, who are on water only fasting do have much less toxic effects from the standards of care. So, so I always think that, that yeah, you know, it, it can be used together with standards of care. Um, you know, whether it's better that way or is it better by itself? Um, you know, we're still working out the details, but um, yeah, I, I think it can be, it could be done with standards of care and you discuss this with your oncologist and see what they think. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Michelle, for that. Next we have Kaylee. Kaylee, what's your question? Thank you. Please, have studies been done uh, correlating the advent and increase of the use of cell phones along with the rise of the, the glioblastomas. And is there also a study being done or has been done of where the tumors in the brain occur and correlating that where the cell phones are held to the head? Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> well, I uh, went to England a couple of years ago where they were looking at um, the kinds of magnetic uh, pulses that come out of a cell phone. Um, I think the risk is probably more for young people, uh, young kids where their skull is less thick um, and they really penetrate deep. <clears throat> the, the, ar the arguments were that, you know, cell phone electromagnetic waves don't cause mutations. And, and therefore uh, they would say that, they, that, that the cell phones don't have any impact on brain cancer, but the whole thing, mutations are irrelevant anyway. So uh, um, what's important is how, how with electromagnetic uh, pulses potentially initiate a tumor. And what happens is heat, the heat from the cell phones can actually cause inflammation in the microenvironment. And it's inflammation in the microenvironment of the cells that ultimately leads to mitochondrial damage in the origin of cancer. The mutations are largely irrelevant. So um, the question then should become, is it possible that cell phones could create an abnormality in the, in the microenvironment of the brain that could elicit uh, a brain tumor? And the answer is probably more likely in young people than in older people, um, only because of the, as I said, the skull thickness. So the, it's an important question. Uh, and considering how widely used the cell phones are, computers and a lot of different kinds of things, they probably do represent a risk factor. It's very hard to quantify uh, that risk factor, but obviously uh, knowing you know, 5G networks and all these kinds of things, electromagnetic radiation, it's, it's, it's probably a risk factor. It's been very hard to specifically say that someone's tumor was caused by cell phone use. Usually it's a combination of a number of different things that would probably elicit something like that. But we certainly cannot rule out uh, completely that cell phone use is, com is com an innocuous and has no relationship to the origin of cancer. So I think there's a possibility there, but uh, I, I don't do that kind of research and I'll let, I'll leave that to others. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, next we have Gretchen. Gretchen, what is your question? Thank you very much for your input. Um, uh, as you reject the standards of care for cancer, and it would appear that you respect and have done an extensive amount of research and publishing, have you respectfully Research the cancer work of Nishio Kushi and macrobiotics, part of the collection of the Smithsonian's National Archives. Um, macrobiotics deals a lot with the acid alkaline balance for one aspect. And as far back as the 60s, had far reaching success in dealing with cancer 
and other maladies. I, I've been involved with the macrobiotic community since 2003, and I have equated macrobiotics to plant-based eating for mensa-level th thinkers. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly, um, well, we did some research on this, actually. I'm writing, in fact, I'm working on a big paper right now for the alkalinization thing. The, the uh, acid, the acidity is caused by the fermentation metabolism of the tumor cells. So that creates local, lo local inflammation and acidification of the microenvironment from the waste products of the tumor cells, which facilitates the, the spread. Uh, we try to stop metastatic cancer by um, uh, uh, using alkaline uh, materials, uh, what is it, sodium hydroxide, one of these things. We couldn't get any therapeutic benefit from it at all. Um, the, uh, so th the best way to stop acidification is pull the plug on the fermentation metabolism. If you do that, you're going to stop local acidification. As I said, you know, you, you can do a lot of different kinds of things. If you know what's causing the cancer to grow, then just pull the plug on that and see what happens. If my, if macrobiotics can do that, then do that. You know, it's just, uh, you know, um, sodium boro, what is it? What is that? Baking soda. We tried that to try to alkaline, it didn't work at all. So uh, um, it didn't stop met our metastatic cancer. Maybe it'll stop somebody's, I don't know. But, uh, you know, we know what the problem is. Uh, we know how to go after the problem. Just people just have to know that they can do it or not do it. You know, it's whatever they want to do. Well, I, my, my real question was, and I, I if you haven't uh, researched uh, the workings of Nishio Kushi on cancer, I respectfully suggest that you might be fascinated by what you find. Okay, I'll, I'll look into that, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm filling in for John. We had to step away on, to do some technical stuff. So my name is Nancy and the next question is from Aaron. Aaron, I'm going to un unmute you if you could ask your question. Hi, so as a follow-up to the answer you gave Steve about what food should we eat uh, or how they affect uh, our uh, our uh, sugar intake and 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 uh, ketosis. So you you suggested to use a device and check. So my question would be, how much time after you eat the food you should test yourself and see how does the the food affect you? And my second question is uh, uh, about what are your thoughts about immunotherapy? Do you think that this is also toxic uh, uh, treatment? Thank you. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, you can try it. We, 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 we did these experiments on, uh, on ourselves and students. Um, uh, we gave uh, Coca-Cola, right? Uh, and we tested red wine as well. Um, so we have, uh, you, you, the, the way we did this was we, we, we had the, the person or the student um, not eat anything for like uh, 36 hours. So you kind of burn up your glycogen in the, in the liver. You get kind of a nice uh, baseline. And then uh, drink a Coca-Cola, um, you know, standard high carbo carbohydrate Coke. So uh, my associate did this. Um, and the, the blood sugar, uh, we measured the blood sugar just before they drink the Coca-Cola. And it was about uh, 89 milligrams per deciliter, okay, which is, which is good. You know, it's with a normal, normal in the normal range. And then we, uh, she drank the Coca-Cola and we waited 15 minutes and we measured the blood sugar again. And it was 165 milligrams per deciliter in 15 minutes. Now, of course, insulin surge will, will gradually reduce the sugar, um, but it takes in, in Coca-Cola. And then one of my other students uh, went on a three-day water-only fast and then drank a, 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 a glass of, of red wine, uh, uh, Cabernet, uh, um, uh, you know, low, low uh, a, a, a thick red wine, I guess you could say. And the blood sugar didn't change at all. It, it, it was shown that the Cabernet did not raise the blood sugar in striking comparison to Coca-Cola. So, you know, these kinds of experiments, everyone should, or every, people can do on their, on their own. Like the answer to your question, you can get the answer to your question by measuring your GKI uh, certain periods of time after you eat certain things. And that's what I said. So eat a banana and see how high it goes uh, versus taking in grapefruit. Uh, all of these things can be done. You have to measure before, 
get the get the number, and then and then after uh, a certain period of time after, you know, you can do it at fifteen minutes an hour, and you can see your blood. You can see gradually if it declines, that means your insulin is working. If the blood sugar stays up and it doesn't go down, you got an insulin problem. So uh, uh, insulin insensitivity, this is what underlies type two diabetes. And a lot of type two diabetics are at high risk for cancer because they can't clear the glucose out of the system after they eat this thing. So a lot of these things can be done by the individual themselves. What was the other part of your question? About um, immune, immunotherapy. Oh yeah. This is something that you know been offered lately. And what are your thoughts about this type of uh, treatment? Yeah, well, it's very expensive. Um, it has the probability of giving you some therapeutic advantage, like that paper I just showed at the beginning of the lecture on the non-small cell cancer. Um, but it also can accelerate how fast you, the tumor can grow. So it's a mixed bag. It's not really clear. Some people do really well in an immunotherapy. And uh, it's funny, an interesting paper came out not, not long ago, and they call lactic acid a, um, a checkpoint inhibitor block. Lactic acid blocks that they think will block the effects of immunotherapy. Well, the lactic acid is coming from the, the, the tumor's use of glucose, dumping out the lactic acid. So again, immunotherapies will probably work a lot better if the patient is in nutritional ketosis. I mean, this is, it becomes very, very clear. As a matter of fact, I think all of these cancer treatments will work much better if the patient is in nutritional ketosis before they take the therapy. So, um, and that's becoming more, this number of papers coming out saying that immunotherapies can work better if the patient is in nutritional ketosis. Then the question becomes, if you do nutritional ketosis with pressed pulse, why are you taking immunotherapy in the first place? It doesn't make any sense. So, uh, and it's also immunotherapies are based on the somatic mutation theory of the disease. So if cancer is not a genetic disease, why are you using immunotherapies in the first place? But you know, they'll do it because they, they don't understand the rest of the biology of the disease. So, um, but you know, it's gonna be a transition uh, period before the field comes to realize what, how, how the best way to manage this disease is. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank, thank you very much, Aaron. Okay, so the next person up is uh, uh, Deborah. I'm going to unmute you if you could ask your question, please. Hi, um, thank you for t taking me again. I just, I have like two things to ask. One was, um, we've talked a lot about treating cancer and these, all these kind of programs and thoughts and ketosis and different treatments for cancer. Are there any things at this point that you recommend along these lines where you've studied that helps those of us without cancer um, to beat the odds of, you know, our doctors who told us you're going to get it anyhow, just no matter which one, because it's genetic, um, just how to be more preventative. I know, ridiculous. <laughs> and then the other thing I just want to ask quick, only because I was exposed to it in, um, in South Africa was the use of ozone treatment. Um, and what your thoughts were about ozone, if it's just hocus pocus, or if it's actually something that's beneficial in it, because it, it was in a preventative nature, you know, at a health spa thing. So those are my questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, the ozone uh, part of this is, uh, we tried that. And there are some examples, I think, in the literature. It's not like many publications on that. Uh, it didn't work for us in the, in the, in the preclinical in the preclinical system. Um, uh, but so I, I mean, to focus, I, I was thinking more about the, the ozone because we did try that. Um, we, we didn't publish it because we, we had a couple of students that were doing it, uh, you know, how, how the ozone is nice and we were looking at cancer and this kind of thing. I'm not going to say that ozone doesn't, doesn't uh, help. Um, it's just that it's not as profound as what we see when we target the glucose and glutamine. And what was the first part of your question again? I the, just, uh, as I said, I was doing ozone. Oh yeah, to... prevention. Yes, prevention. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, uh, prevention. Okay, well, that's a different, uh, okay. So if, if here's the situation. If the origin of cancer is the result of damage to the oxidative phosphorylation system in a cell in a particular organ, that's the origin of cancer. So it's hard to get cancer if your mitochondria remain healthy. Okay, so as long as you have a diet and lifestyle that reduce inflammation and maintain the health and vitality of your mitochondria, the probability of getting cancer is very rare. 
uh, primitive tribe, like the great uh, humanitarian physician, Albert Schweitzer, uh, was studied primitive peoples in different continents. And cancer was very, very rare in humans that uh, were in a diet and lifestyle similar, similar to that that we evolved in. Uh, Eskimos, uh, Inuits of, of, of the cold climates, uh, had no term for cancer. Um, and they're eating you know, blubber and fat in, the, in their environment. As long as you have a diet and lifestyle that does not cause systemic inflammation, uh, the probability of getting cancer is very rare. So why, why is our societies throughout the world where cancer now is overtaking heart disease, uh, uh, why are we have this problem? It's 99% of it is diet and lifestyle. We did not evolve to eat jelly-filled donuts, pizza, Coke. This was not part of our existence. This all started with the Neolithic period. Once we started using grains, grains that have a lot of energy, yes, that help. We got bigger as a people. We got, I mean, um, and, uh, but, but it also, uh, highly processed carbohydrate foods over the last 35 or 40 years are putting us at enormous risk for cancer. Um, until people come to understand this, we're, we're, we're not going to be able to prevent the disease. So, you know, most people don't care. They don't care about prevention. I mean, a lot, I can tell you right now, just go, you just go down to any you know, food shop. You see people, they're, they're eating, they're eating things. You say, are you worried about cancer? I don't care about cancer. Then when you get cancer, then they're at, oh, now what are you going to do? I, I got cancer now. Now, they, now what are you going to do? So, but yeah, prevention is, is if people want to, you know, re, uh, avoid uh, toxic foods and high carbohydrate, things that are going to cause systemic inflammation, then you put yourself at risk for cancer. Okay, smoking puts you at risk for cancer. Obesity puts you at risk for cancer. And where does obesity come from? Lack of exercise and eating high carbohydrate foods puts you at risk for obesity. Systemic inflammation, cardiovascular disease, Cancer, dementia, they're all related to the diet and lifestyle. Very little on the genetic spot. It's mostly that. So you know that you can, you know, do things to prevent. All right. Thank you, Dr. Siegfried. And thanks, Deborah, for that question.